Welcome to this third um, talk in the algorithmic pattern series. Um, I'm very um, excited to um, introduce Ron Eglash. Um, before I do that, I'll, while people are settling down, um, I'll just say a few words. So if you haven't got a cup of tea yet, you might just have time to grab one. Um, uh, and also greetings to both people who are joining us live and people who are joining us um, in the future. I hope things are well in the future, um, that we have generative justice and all our problems are solved. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the previous, so this is the third uh, talk, as I said, the first one was from Laura Devendorf talking about weaving. Um, and introducing her AdaCAD software for making algorithmic patterns for weaving. Of course, weaving itself is an ancient algorithmic and digital art itself. Um, and then we had Vanel Noel talking about wire bending, um, the uh, Trinidad Carnival practice um, of mass making, um, and her craft grammar. Um, that was part of that. Um, and this talk um, has the title, let me find it. Yes. Uh, the End of Innocence for Craft Grammars, Why We Need Decolonial Computing. So um, yeah, this would be a very nice uh, second, uh, third talk following those previous two. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh yes, um, thank you very much for Wendy Osmond, the, um, who is providing professional live captions for this talk, which reminds me I should talk a little bit slower for Wendy, sorry. <laughs> um, to make sure you're watching those, if you're watching live, have a look at algorithmicpattern.org slash live and you'll find them there. Um, if you're watching on YouTube um, in the future, then hopefully you'll be able to watch the captions through YouTube, but it'll just take a couple of days after um, the live event to edit them and get them up there. Um, right, so uh, that is the stream warmed up. Um, feel free to say hello in the comments. Um, but for now, I should introduce Ron to the stream. Hello, Ron. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, uh, very excited to uh, hear your talk. Um, the end of innocence for craft grammars, why we need decolonial computing, as I said. Um, would you like to jump straight into it and introduce yourself, perhaps? I would like to jump straight into it. Um, I'm Ron Aglash. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan School of Information. I have a secondary appointment um, in the Stamp School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. Um, let me line up my um, slides here. Um, end of innocence for craft grammars. So I often uh, speak with uh, students or faculty who are interested in what we've been doing um, with this set of, of simulation tools, the culturally situated design tools. Um, and they've gone out and um, started doing something like this themselves, or they're just asking about it. Um, but they often come to it with, with a kind of innocence saying, well, I'm just a scientist. So any pattern I, I want to simulate, I should be able to simulate. I don't need to ask anybody's permission for it because I'm not making money off of it. Um, and I think we need to end that, that sense of innocence um, and start thinking a little bit more about our uh, accountability and responsibility. So uh, almost every introduction to computing um, starts out with something like an algorithm is like a recipe, some, some kind of analogy about recipes having inputs and steps for process and outputs. If you Google uh, that phrase, an algorithm is like a recipe, you come back with over 14 million hits. So it's so a pretty popular analogy. Um, so let's, let's start with that. Here's a lovely uh, CNN article about um, these platforms and, and uh, websites that have been scooping up uh, recipes from really wonderful, heartfelt blogs. So somebody's talking about, in this case, um, her memories of uh, living in Shanghai and, and having mung bean popsicles and puts that recipe out there. And here's my daughter and she's making this thing. Um, now we're living in America. Um, and so these uh, uh, websites um, 
uh, go about scraping the web, right? Scooping up these recipes and, and decontextualizing them, taking them away from the stories um, and then commodifying them. So now you can get all these recipes, um, but you have to put up with a little bit of advertising. Um, so you can see, I hope, the relationship between folks uh, deciding to do simulations of whatever uh, indigenous pattern or, or, or craft pattern they want to, um, and these websites scooping up whatever recipe they want to. So these platforms are, in a sense, the new colonialism. They're scooping up um, not physical bodies and materials, but data bodies and materials. So we've gone from uh, enslaved people uh, and hardwoods and spices and, and ivory and whatnot um, to scooping up personal data and medical data and social networks and images and web searches. And so these patterns um, or craft patterns um, may become part of that if we're not um, actively resisting uh, that, that neo-colonialism, that data colonialism. So in, in creating the CSDT website, um, we've developed five steps um, for trying to ensure a kind of accountability and responsibility for what we're doing. The first and the most fundamental is just asking permission. Just contact some folks uh, that um, uh, uh, embody this practice in some way. They're, they're respected uh, practitioners within that community of, of practice. So here's... Um, Professor Audrey Bennett, uh, my research partner, as well as my life partner, um, interviewing um, Detroit quilter Carol Harris, who does these uh, improv-inspired, jazz-inspired quilts. Um, and of course, getting, getting permission and explaining to her uh, what we want to do with STEM education with underrepresented students for this. Um, and then the next step is interviewing the artisans um, and researching the cultural background and really trying to see it from what an anthropologist would call the emic view, from the, from the, the uh, native's point of view, from the practitioner's point of view, not from our point of view, right? So I don't wanna start imposing my ideas about geometry and algorithms. I wanna understand what they're trying to say. And often if I'm working um, with an indigenous group, they don't wanna start there. And so they'll say, well, first let me show you um, the tree that we're getting this bark from. Um, or let, let me uh, tell you about what happened when Europeans first showed up here. Uh, and they, they want to make sure that I, I don't have a big head, right? That I don't think I'm better than them and I'm going to start scooping up their stuff um, without understanding their point of view and their side of the story. Um, and, and eventually, um, if I show a, a willingness to be open to that, uh, folks will then tell me, oh yeah, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm using this thing where I flip these around this way or I rotate them this way. Um, we start to get at those, those geometric algorithms. And then, of course, um, we want to simulate these within a block space language or some kind of interface that um, it'll be really easy for students and community members without any STEM training to, to understand and gain something from. Um, and so we need to do some sort of translation uh, between the way that the artisans are talking about this and the way it would be represented in a classroom in math on mathematics or in a computing classroom or just representing it to the software, getting the machine to understand what it is that we want it to do. Um, and uh, 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 fourth, embedding that in our culturally situated design tools applets. And then the fifth, the fifth part of this is making sure that we loop that value uh, back to the community, that, that it's not just us gaining from it. Um, and so the, the, the low-hanging fruit there is always education, right? So if you can go into a STEM education classroom um, where uh, local students are not doing well in uh, math or not having much interest in STEM, um, and you can help raise those scores and enhance that interest, um, that's really great. Often um, that's an opportunity to bring in um, artisans and elders and, and other folks that the kids don't usually see in an educational context, bring them into the classroom. Um, and that's been really exciting. Um, and then once we started doing that, um, some of the adults said, well, wait a minute, um, why, why aren't you doing a workshop for us? Right. Um, and so I'll show you a few examples um, where we, we've been uh, involving the artisans uh, in this kind of technology development. Um, and then finally, there's a research side to this, 
So, so um, how can we uh, enhance um, just our, our understanding of the of the world, right? Um, how can we en enhance the the um, intellectual basis for opposing racism? Aside from saying racism is bad, how can you say ra racism is stupid? That it does not have uh, a very good basis. And there's been, of course, centuries of scientific racism, right? Um, on the other side of this. Uh, conversation. So you, you, you need to be able to have a substantial intellectual base in order to fight that. All right. Um, so um, uh, we're after, uh, in a sense, a redefinition of algorithm, not simply an algorithm is like a recipe in that it has inputs, step for process and outputs, but rather an algorithm is like a recipe in that it describes information relationships over time, right? And those information relationships may be passing on data or passing on procedures um, so that it includes the, those human and also uh, the ecosystem, the non-human relationships. And we could further refine that um, and make a distinction between the extractive algorithms, the ones that are facilitating one-way relationships over time and versus generative algorithms that are nurturing circular relationships over time. So for example, Bitcoin, um, is a one-way relationship. So Bitcoin uses cryptographic security. You have Bitcoin miners um, who, who are validating these transactions and getting rewarded for it, but that takes huge amounts of power. And so you end up with this giant carbon footprint, three times the size uh, of New Zealand's carbon footprint, the, the, the same size as Sweden's carbon footprint. Um, really, really huge amount uh, of um, uh, carbon is, is being dumped into the atmosphere. And so in a sense, what that's doing is it's taking what should be public goods, the, the health of our air and our water and our soil, and converting that through crypto computation into private wealth. It is privatizing the commons in this, this one-way algorithm. Now let's compare that um, to a generative algorithm that we would see in an indigenous uh, context. So I, I um, work with some Navajo weavers and with the um, uh, Dene Environmental Institute and Dene Community College um, for a few years. Um, and one of the things that, that first struck me was the strangeness of the geometry. So here's a weave that's doing up one over one, up one over one. And you would think that would be 45 degrees, but it's not, it's 30 degrees. So um, at first I was confused by this. And then I realized, oh, of course, the, the uh, warp threads that are vertical um, are much thicker than the weft threads that are horizontal. And they tap down those, those weft threads with a, a sort of fork um, as they're weaving to compress it. Um, and so you end up with, with a, a grid that is not based on squares, but rather on uh, rectangles with a different aspect ratio. So as you might imagine, there's perfectly valid, valid axioms and theorems um, for that grid. It's just they're not the same <laughs> as the axioms and theorems that you would get on a square Cartesian grid, right? You have a, a different set of geometric algorithms at work. And I spoke with one woman um, and her mother, her mother did not speak any English. And so she was translating for me. Um, and so she said sort of out of mom's um, earshot, um, yeah, you know, mom had this really complex weaving algorithm and I, uh, she, she wanted to get paid for it. She didn't want to give it to me for free. Um, but I knew she was just going to um, go down there um, where there's a bunch of vending machines <laughs> and destroy her health on those vending machine, that vending machine food. Um, so I reversed engineered it, right? So there, there's a whole algorithm economy that's going on um, on the Navajo Nation with these weaves. It's really spectacular. Um, now, if we dive in a little bit deeper, um, you might know that back in the uh, 1960s and 70s, when computer graphics was just getting born, uh, we discovered this problem with pixels, that if you do a slanted line, you get staircasing. And so in order to compensate for that, we have what's called anti-aliasing. If you look, uh, zoom in with Photoshop or something and look at a straight line, uh, you'll see that there's this sort of uh, 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 smoothing effect that's being done by, by uh, changing the shades of color as you move out 
from the line. But uh, many of the Navajo artists I found use inverse aliasing. So it's actually emphasizing the transition between these um, uh, uh, steps, these nice clean Euclidean steps and this very uh, uh, emphasized jaggedness on, on the other side of it. Um, now, if you look up inverse aliasing, I don't think you'll find it. I think that's an original Navajo algorithm and not that just simply doesn't exist. Why would you want inverse aliasing, right? Um, but in, but in, in this case, they, they've, they've developed it for, uh, I think, a particular purpose. At least that's what's come out in the conversations I've had with them. Um, but to understand that, you need to actually visit the sheep corral where the wool is, is, is being grown. Um, so this is a, a sheep corral I, I visited on the Navajo Nation. Um, and you can see there's different colors of, of sheep. And so some of the colors in the weave are coming from that. But other colors in the weave are coming from plant dyes. And it's easy to find a very large diversity of colors because you have very large uh, diversity of plants. So it's um, high entropy, right? High diversity. Um, and the reason there's such a high diversity of plants around these sheep herding areas is because the sheep are like little plant vacuum cleaners, right? They're eating, going out there and eating all these plants and then coming back to the corral and pooping out the seeds with a, a little uh, a blob of fertilizer around it. And, and so you've got these explosions of biodiversity around these areas. And so these women are, are uh, using a kind of circular economy. Um, so there's a little uh, quote here um, from uh, one of the Navajo Community College directors, what the women weave is part of the environment. If you take something from the environment, you must give something back, right? These Navajo women have a relationship with the sheep. She must respect them. Um, she uses the wool in her weaving and she must respect the weaving too. So it's really um, a relational economy of giving back and reciprocity and, and circularity, right? Um, and so you can think about this as not um, high entropy, but actually a kind of modulation of entropy. And I think a, a lot of folks, um, I often hear folks talk about the, this, this sort of uh, sotuluthin, so, so, so right? This um, uh, kind, of, kind of highly diverse, tentacled, wormy earthiness. Um, but that's only one part of it. That's the high entropy part is the earthiness. Um, you also have the low entropy part, which is this very well organized, very Euclidean weaving. And, and in fact, I suspect that that's what's being shown here is that is that modulation um, between the highly diverse uh, texture, uh, jaggedness um, and the highly organized steps. Um, so, so you have this, this modulation between the high entropy and the low entropy, and that goes back and forth, right? It's a kind of pump that's pumping unalienated value, not the value that gets extracted and, and taken off by corporation, but unalienated value that goes through this generative cycle over time. Um, now, uh, uh, these uh, uh, non-Western indigenous cultures are not the only place where you can find this. If you go back far enough in time, um, Europe also had its Celtic tribes. And here you can see in green in that map, Celtic tribes at one time were spread all the way from Ireland to Turkey. Um, and you can see this shield that was actually dredged up out of the Thames um, in London. Um, and you can see the, the, there's birds in there and the birds are connected to some vines and the vines are connected to other birds. And it's this very much um, uh, entangled uh, uh, generative web work uh, in the, the indigenous the spiritual practices, the Celts. Um, but later on, that gets abstracted, right? And it gets turned into this much more formalized interlaced style that's applied to this new religion called Christianity. So, so Europe uh, cannibalizes itself, it colonizes itself, um, and that's just practice for colonizing other places. So those historical roots of extraction have to do with a, a kind of um, homegrown colonialism that, that can, then gets extended elsewhere. And you know, in, in some cases, we've liberated um, the, those lands. We've wrested uh, the, the ownership of the lands from the colonials back to the indigenous people. 
Um, but we still, our minds are in some sense still colonized, right? We still think of things in those terms. And so we don't, we don't see what an extractive economy we've created, that we're extracting ecological value, we're extracting labor value, we're allowing our, our social networks to be colonized, our neighborhoods to be colonized, both physically and online. Now, you might think that taking out capitalism from the equation would fix that extraction process. But if you look at the textbooks that Soviet engineers were using back in the 1930s, they were the same textbooks that American engineers were using back in the 1930s. So no surprise that this sort of bureaucratic top-down socialism has failed just as badly as laissez-faire capitalism around the world and continues to do so today. Both capitalism and communism, um, at least the state form of communism, are based on this idea of the extraction of value, that you're, you're taking value away from those who generate it, the non-humans in nature and the humans uh, in labor um, and, and the uh, social connections in society. You're taking that value away and you're giving it away to either the owners of the corporations or, or the, the state in the case of communism. And it's very hard once that value has been extracted, um, even with the best of intentions, it's very hard to, to put that back in the bottle. So it's much better, at least as a model, to think about, um, to look at what these indigenous societies have been doing, that they've been practicing these circular economies and, and thinking about them and creating strategies. You know, how am I gonna keep this value from being alienated from those who generate it. This is thinking that's that's evolved um, with local technologies over thousands of years. So no surprise um, that you sometimes see these self-organizing patterns um, reflecting a kind of bottom-up self-organizing um, economic system. Um, in the case of Africa, of course, you've got these wonderful fractal architectures that are reflecting uh, and symbolizing ancestral relationships and other kinds of, of spiritual um, meanings but not just in the symbolic uh, sense, um, but also in the actual physical sense. So here's my colleague, Gabriel Boache, um, uh, uh, recently passed away, unfortunately, um, harvesting bark from the body tree, uh, Bridelia, um, the, that bark goes into these big vats that are boiled for ink. The um, strained out bark that's had the pigment removed is now composted and put back into the soil, or in traditional times, it would go into a sacred forest. And that biodiversity then spreads back to the areas where the body tree grows. So the whole thing has this wonderful circular economy to it. Now you can see down at the bottom, this diversity of, of Adinkra symbols, each of those carries a certain meaning, um, as does the symbol in the, the center here, which is symbolizing the um, balance between humans and nature. Um, each of these symbols has a particular meaning that carries some moral uh, um, provocation, don't be a bully, for example. One, one person does not make a nation, for example. Um, and, and that's because um, people are jerks wherever you go. It's not that folks in indigenous contexts are angels. They have just as many foibles as anybody else, um, but they've created over thousands of years of effort, um, a system that prevents jerkiness, right? That, that tries to, to cut it off from ever happening and has restorative mechanisms rather than punitive uh, mechanisms for keeping things in balance. That also occurs at the level of algorithms. So, so we can see Western algorithms very easily because we're trained to spot those, but we have trouble um, even, even visualizing or understanding what these indigenous algorithms are because for one, we think of algorithm as stopping at code rather than extending into the ecosystem. Um, but ask anybody in, in the Bitcoin world where, where they're mining their, their Bitcoins and they'll point to some giant power plant. So, so back in uh, New York where I used to live, um, there's a, a, a big uh, power plant in, in upstate New York uh, that's now been uh, completely dedicated just to Bitcoin mining. And unfortunately, it's using fossil fuels. Um, last I checked, it hadn't passed the uh, Department of Environmental Conservation uh, um, uh, a document check. And, and so um, all kinds of, of really terrible uh, environmental effects are being caused by that. So in order to um, make these things accessible, after going through this process and making sure that what we were doing was okay with the community of practice and coming up with ways of bringing that value back to those 
communities. We've put these things online um, at the Culture of the Situated Design Tools website. Um, and we've included uh, both indigenous ethno computing um, as well as different kinds of hybridity. So if you ask the new generation, they'll say, yeah, what grandma and grandpa did was cool, but you know, I wanna be a hip hop artist. So I wanna take that polar coordinate algorithm that the, uh, my uh, Anishinaabe uh, uh, forebearers developed, but I wanna use that with um, new kinds of symbolism that's relevant to my generation, right? So it's not just about a kind of purity, you want a kind of hybridity. And you want that, um, pedagogically speaking, to sort of uh, expand in agency. So you might have a point at which you're just being the same old didactic computer science instructor and explaining to students how to use this block space coding system. Um, but you want to, as soon as possible, sort of unleash the student's creativity and let them explore these heritage algorithms, um, let them explore how to do creative renders with a 3D printer or laser cutter or, or just uh, you know old school uh, hand fabrication and explore how to bring that value back to those communities. So we call that generative STEM rather than extractive STEM. Um, and here's an example of the uh, work we were doing with cosmetologists in Albany, New York. Uh, here's an example of work we were doing in Michigan um, with the Anishinaabe community and the um, Center for Native American Studies uh, at Northern Michigan University um, using these arc-based uh, 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 geometry. So, so uh, iterative sequences of arcs getting um, larger and larger and larger as you move um, from one end of the canoe uh, towards the center. Um, and you can see the same thing being done with creating snowshoes. And in this case, uh, elders teaching folks um, that tradition of, of wigwams, which is also made with those bending those arcs. Um, and that's a relationship with trees in a particular kind of way. Um, so we, we teach the students um, starting uh, with some review of the uh, traditional approach and then their coding um, and then bringing that back to a kind of physical construction. We get these lovely narratives from students. I believe my design represents the two worlds I come from, one being my, of my native heritage and the other being the technology era. With the completion of my structure, I was able to combine two worlds and accumulate an interest in engineering. So some really spectacular um, uh, 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 feedback from the students on this. But it got me thinking, you know, on the research side, what exactly were these curves? So we were modeling them as, as parabolas because that's what the math teachers teach and it worked pretty close as an approximation. Um, but I started to realize these are actually Bezier curves, which are much more complex. And just on, on a whim, I started to look into who was Bezier? And it turns out he had worked at these um, French car factories, Citroën um, in, in, in France, and um, was looking at folks using these wood splines. So they were bending wood to get those beautiful sinuous curves in those you know, space age cars, the 1950s, right? Um, and then um, he would computerize those. So they're the same curves, the Bezier curves, you can see in these Anishinaabe design, same uh, 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 family. Um, but when they asked Bezier, how did you come up with this? Bezier said, well, you know, I, I, this is my intellectual work, right? I have intellectual ownership of this. When you ask the Anishinaabe, um, they say the wood taught us this, the wood were the teachers. And of course, Bezier was learning from the wood too, but in the Western tradition, there has to be a singular owner and that owner has to be a, a human being, right? And so you can see that it's the, the same um, algorithm uh, at base and this, the same generative source of that algorithm. But in one case, it's being extracted. In the other case, the Anishinaabe are bringing that value back to those who generated it in the first place, which is the wood. Um, and so here we have that generative cycle uh, bringing that value back to the community. Um, now, in many cases, when you look at these uh, traditional algorithmic structures, you'll see that it took a really, really long time to do. And if you think about um, what, how capitalism handles value, you know, if, if I um, come home from work and I go to the parking lot, I don't see my boss stuffing 10,000 ears of corn into the trunk of his car. Right. Capitalism has come up with a way of invisibilizing 
the unfairness of that labor extraction. So, so everybody looks the same and we're told it's not polite to talk about money, right? We don't wanna expose the unfairness of that system. But these indigenous traditions do exactly the opposite. The reason you would take, you know, four hours to plate somebody's hair in these intricate braiding patterns is exactly to show the labor value. It's to visibilize the labor value instead of invisibilizing it the way that capitalism does. And so we should be able to come up with similar kinds of mechanisms for our current context, ways of authenticating the labor value and not allowing it to be invisibilized. So I threw this problem at um, one of our graduate students here, Kwame Robinson, um, and I asked him to create an AI algorithm that could deal with the fact that in uh, many situations, in particular in this case, Ghana, um, there's imports of fake fabrics. So what appears to be kente cloth is not actually kente cloth, it's made in a factory somewhere, it's just kente print, but the tourists can't tell the difference. And so he developed a little AI algorithm and is now trying to um, get it onto cell phones um, that can actually tell the difference between the real stuff that's handwoven and the fake stuff that's factory made. But we don't wanna stop there, right? That's the way capitalism would think about it in terms of the point of sale. What we wanna think about it um, is in terms of the point of production. And so we want the AI not only to recognize that it's, it's real handmade, but also to have a way of linking the person who's buying the cloth to the person who wove the cloth. And so if we can facilitate, for example, a FaceTime conversation where you could say, hey, you know, I bought your cloth. Can you come into my K through 12 classroom um, and, and give a little talk about um, what this weaving is and how you did it? And, um, you know, I see there's a payment uh, feature here so I can pay you for that. Right. So you could start to establish um, the building blocks of what would become an artisanal economy. Um, and so if you go to AfricanFuturist.org, you can buy the shirts that are made in, in uh, some of the beginnings of that artisanal economy. Uh, the Nash National Science Foundation was kind enough to award us a grant. So I now have um, graduate students. Uh, in this case, uh, Matthew Garvin is talking with Don Smith, who is a fabrication artist in Detroit. Um, about the work that she does. And we just held our first workshop uh, this weekend about what features they wanted to see in this um, artisanal economy website. Um, here's a, a, a visualization of how that network might play out um, in Ghana. And for more about these applications, folks can go to generativejustice.org. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. That was an uh, amazing uh, whirlwind. Uh, so much in there. <laughs> um, I think everything was in there, actually. Um, yes, uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this idea of um, low entropy and high entropy and um, the kind of uh, connection between weaving and the environment as a kind of oscillation between these two. Um, I'm wondering if you see, and you talked about um, the relationship between researchers and practitioners in a similar kind of feedback loop. Do you see entropy there as well? Is is research sort of looking at a lower entropy version of the of the real practice? Um, I'm, That's I'm thinking, a... uh, yeah, I was just thinking in terms of like, if you take a practice and put it in a computer program, that surely is a simpler kind of representation of what's really going on, would you say? Or I, I, I would, and, and, and I would caution that, um, you know, you could simulate disorder, right? You could, you could throw in a little random number generator and say, oh, look, now it's high entropy. Um, but of course, that's a very shallow version of, of entropy, right? So, so when I said entropy, that's really a shorthand for thinking about complexity. Um, and, and it's a kind of structured entropy. So when I was showing you that list of all the different plants in the Native American ecosystem, it's not as though nature is just rolling dice and randomly throwing out plants, right? The, these plants interact with each other in, in a kind of um, ecological evolution. And so it's really a kind of structured 
entropy, which is a bit of an oxymoron if entropy means disorder and structured means order, um, but it's a kind of uh, a structured entropy or layered uh, um, entropy. Um, so, so the word entropy doesn't quite get at it, but, but just using that for shorthand, um, I think um, part of my reason for doing that was because I was listening to folks in the humanities talk about this contrast between industrialization and extraction and, and colonialism and the indigenous life as, as one of holism versus reductionism, right? Um, and I, I, I've really grown to dislike that word holism and, and all this, the synonyms that are used for it, like entanglement, because um, I don't think it's, it, I don't think it says very much. Um, so you could say, look how entangled the Navajo weavers are with their ecosystem, but BitNet's entangled too with an ecosystem, right? It's, it's just entangled in a really destructive way. Um, and so, so I think we, we need another handle on these things to grasp what's going on. Um, if you say the indigenous is high entropy, the indigenous is, you know, unbridled complexity, uh, you're not really uh, um, paying attention to the weaving and to what it is that that the these women are are doing, which is very highly organized and very algorithmic in the typical sense of meaning a, a, a highly structured process, right? Um, mm. And that has that has implications. So when we say holistic, often what people will use as a synonym is the word naturalistic. And when you start making appeals to nature, it leads to things like, well, I think only certain kinds of sexuality are natural. So I'm going to be homophobic, right? Mm -hmm. I think only certain kinds of citizens are natural to this particular nation. And so I'm gonna be anti-immigrant. And, and so it really does, does you uh, no favor to reduce this to organicism or holism or naturalism or th th those kinds of if, if I can use an oxymoron again, um, a reductive form of anti-reductionism, right? I, do, I don't want it to just land on this one bumper sticker, this one word and say, this is more diverse or, or this is more, more entropic. Um, so so getting, getting at the modulation between the two at least gives us a little bit more nuance um, and it could serve as a model for other sorts of things. For example, um, when we're dealing with gender, we could say, well, let's just do away with gender, right, altogether. Um, but I don't think that that's doing us much good if I'm interested in getting more women into computing. And, and, and so you, you, you can't be hypocritical about it and say, on the one hand, gender oppresses us and I want to get rid of gender. Oh, and by the way, I have this program for getting more women into computing. And so you, you need some other handle. Um, so I often think of uh, modulations in gender diversity, um, in gender entropy, if you will, in, in sort of similar ways. At, at, at some points, we need to be able to grasp this with some fairly simple categories and terminologies. And at the same time, we need to say, yes, but we can't have a barrier there. It can't stop there, right? It, it needs to be in conversation with, if not in oscillation with, these other ways of of thinking about it. Hmm. Um, thank you. I, th I guess um, the um, it just made me think about weaving in particular and how it has such uh, there's, there's some aspects of it are so simple, um, but only in order to create a space in which you get this complexity emerging. Um, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, yeah. So when we're sim simplifying things, it doesn't mean that the end result is simple. Um, uh, ab absolutely. Yeah. So so if you look if you look at the little backdrop that that you uh, wisely selected, yeah. um, <laughs> that that beautiful um, Anishinaabe tradition, um, those bead patterns are nothing like the Southwest bead patterns, right? Mm -hmm. So the Southwest Southwest bead patterns are a lot, lot like those Southwest weavings. They're very uh, Cartesian and, and linear in that you're on this grid. Um, 
whereas the the uh, northeast uh, I used to use this term woodland Indian, but you know for the most part it's talking about the Anishinaabe nations, uh, Ojibwe and, and Potawatomi uh, and Cree and and so forth. Um, so those 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 Anishinaabe traditions of um, uh, having a more free flowing form that's also using beading. Um, but it's really reflecting the algorithmic nature of plants. And so you'll see these sort of sinuous forms that nonetheless have a kind of repeating um, oscillatory algorithmic pattern to them. Um, one of the things that really stands out in these is the fact that you have many different species all on the same vine. Um, and I've asked some, some of the, the Anishinaabe scholars, you know, what the heck is going on there? Um, and uh, several had mentioned that during missionary times, um, representing anything from traditional culture was forbidden. You were supposed to be, you know, be beating, I don't know, pictures out of the Bible or something. Um, and so this was a form of resistance. Uh, and so part of it came from that. But it was also reflecting a sense that at one level, those plants are indeed all connected. Right. And, and um, recent science has backed that up. So there's now folks that have been doing this tracing of um, how sugars are, tra are traveling along the root system of the forest from tree to tree. So it's not just isolated in one tree. You can actually share uh, your, your calories with with other trees and other organisms um, in the way that that's that's sort of anticipated uh, uh, by the, these Anishinaabe patterns. Um, another scholar I spoke to said, yeah, but you, ha you have to realize they're not just showing you any plants. So in, in a sense, this is our pharmacopoeia. This, this is where we should go to get those medicines, where we should go to get those foods that are going to help our bodies in, in certain particular ways. So it's also a kind of encyclopedia of the, of the ecosystem, which brings you back to the point you were just making, that it's simultaneously simplicity, but also this window to uh, other kinds of complexity. Yeah, it, it feels like it's um, holding a frame in place in which you can explore all the com complexity. Um, and I think it's something that is common to um, heritage practices, um, is this kind of, um, I, I guess it comes down to the fact that a heritage practice is continually innovating, um, working in these really uh, expansive areas um, where um, anything is possible because everything is unique, everything you make is unique because it has your hand in it. Um, uh, and But too often we think about heritage practices as something that needs to be preserved and, and kept static. And then we see these rules and think that that's what they're for, is for keeping them fixed. But actually they're just setting the parameters in which you can explore um, explore through pattern. Um, but yeah, perhaps we should move to some questions from the chat. Um, let's have a look at this one. Uh, Few says, um, when for exploration, Ron, um, one question on generative justice. With the growing focus on reparations, is there room for a generative model for the argument in favour of reparations? That is a fascinating question. Um, so, so um, I, you might notice that I, I don't spend a lot of time um, talking about critique. And I, and I think um, the, the foundation of, of reparations um, are uh, the ability to have that really well-grounded critique. So for example, um, folks have, have said, well, look, I'm uh, the ancestor of enslaved people here's the particular corporations that were making money um, off the, the, the life's blood of my ancestor. These reparation, re reparations um, don't require a new legal framework. You can simply use the current legal framework, right? Um, so, so I don't, I don't um, um, spend a lot of time on that kind of critique simply because, A, I'm not very good at it, and, and B, lots of other people are, who, who are much smarter than me are already doing it. Um, but I, I, I would like to point out um, 
that one could ask about the form of, of reparations. So in what form should reparations take place, right? Um, and so, so um, one of the things that I, I, I recently started to come across that I think is really spectacular um, are these relationships between um, indigenous Native American groups and African American groups. Um, because there's, there's a certain recognition that there's um, a common interest in uh, sort of repairing the world and making it whole again, right? Um, that on the one hand is, is um, founded on the, these observations and lived experiences and, and histories of injustice. Um, but on the other hand, um, are not interested in a, a revenge or some, some sense that, you know, well, now I'm going to get mine, right, this, this, this sense of greed, um, but interested in the kind of reparations that contribute to healing. Um, and so uh, there's a, a beautiful project here in Detroit. I happen to be at the African Bead Museum at the moment. Um, not far from us is the Joy Project. And uh, the Joy Project um, uh, uh, was, was founded by uh, Gabby and Jasmine, who are two of the artisans that we've been working with. Um, and as they talk about this um, urban farm slash garden slash um, uh, uh, historical archive of African diaspora practices, right? Um, they've also pointed out the points at which they've been in contact and dialogue with Native American groups. And, and because other, otherwise, what are you saying? I, 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 I demand the right to, you know, be given land, even though you know that land was stolen from Native Americans in the first place. Right. It, it, it would it would make no sense. And so, yeah, I, I think there is a way in which um, thinking through that lens of generative justice can contribute to the reparations conversation. Um, but I wouldn't say it's at the um, foundations of the rationale for it. It's more at the level of in what form should those reparations take place. And you don't, you don't want to contribute to the extractive economy through that reparations of practice. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's another question. Um, I'm the maintainer of Context Free, a Context Free Design Language Editor Viewer. So this is a, um, a long developed uh, generative art uh, piece of software. Um, what can I do with my program to encourage circular movement of information instead of linear extraction? So quite a practical question, which uh, yeah, I'm but a good one, but, a, re yeah. but a, re a really good one, a really good one. Um, yeah. So, so often um, students will approach me and they'll say, Dr. Aglash, you're doing this all wrong um, because what you need to do is um, uh, create justice at scale. And, and by working with these little artisans and these grassroots groups, um, that's, that's, that's local, that's not at scale. And so what I need to do is um, some justice project that's going to be uh, 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 like Musk, like Elon Musk, and do this massive thing, or, or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, those are my models, a massive thing affects people all around the world. Um, and it's going to imb imbue them with justice. Um, and, and, and so my answer uh, is typically, uh, well, let's think about scale for a moment, right? So, so Edsel Ford had a pretty good idea with, with uh, putting an internal combustion engine on wheels up until the point where he started to go at scale. So as this little local project is pretty neat, but once you start to scale this thing up, you see how utterly disastrous it is. Um, so my, my, my reply to folks is always, um, don't try to design at scale um, at, at, at the beginning. Um, run little local experiments. You know, uh, uh, work with some folks who could use whatever it is you're you're doing at the small scale. Get some feedback from them, um, and then you'll you'll then understand how to grow things in that generative way. Um, don't try to start as the big visionary who had this great idea and just impose on the rest. History is is littered with those failures. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that makes me think about the topic of authorship um which another question brings up as well 
Um, in research, we tend to stick our names on things, whether it's the labs that we found, or if we come up with a framework, we might name it after ourselves and so on. Um, in craft practices, um, things are developed over a much longer time, over generations, and that often there isn't a clear um, person to assign um, a name to a practice like braiding or weaving. Um, so we end up with the situation where um, weaving, for example, is often associated with um, Jacquard, um, who just automated it and didn't actually um, invent any of the weaving structures, which are actually computational, um, for example. Um, so do you think authorship comes in here in, in how we're interacting with communities, how we're feeding things back? Um, how do we assign authorship? Um, when craft practices don't tend to put that much value on authorship? Um. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. So I, I, I talked a little bit about this in the African Fractals book um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the fact that when I um, first arrived in Africa, I, I kept looking for examples of intentionality. I didn't want the fractals to be accidental. So I, I, I didn't want to see a, a, a fractal in design um, to which somebody says, I, I don't know, it just came out that way, right? Um, and, and of course, I got a lot of those kinds of reactions where, where I, I asked, you know, why this? And, and they say, we, we just think it looks pretty that way. Um, but the, the, in, the, in the book, I spent most of my time on cases where I could document either the uh, spiritual practice or the work practice, uh, you know, some, something to I indicate the intentionality of it, right? Because I was really interested in anti-racism, anti-primitivism, um, and, and trying to get at uh, the, the sort of intellectual foundations of those uh, indigenous uh, cultures and, and the tremendous body of knowledge that they built up. Um, but but then uh, you know as, as the the time progressed i was there for a year in, in my my first trip um as time progressed i started to realize wow I, i'm just not getting at the the forms of intentionality that they themselves are using right they're not thinking of this village in terms of the brilliant one architect who imposed this structure on everyone mm -hmm. they're thinking of this village in terms of oh yeah i know you know the guy whose grandfather built that granary, right? And and we the yeah, other rains come every year, and we restore every year, and that's our our ritual that imbues this with a lot of the meaning and spiritual power, and it brings the community together, and it, it wipes the canvas clean, and it gives us a chance to make a new generation of designs. So so that 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 sense of building upon generations is very much integrated into this other form of intentionality. Um, now, David Graeber, the uh, uh, anarchist anthropologist who unfortunately passed away uh, just a few years ago, um, had some wonderful essays where he talked about, for example, living in a commune and trying to get the communal car and re realizing what an enormous barrier it would be, you know, uh, uh, in legal terms, right, in institutional terms and how bureaucracy was created in such a way that it was nearly impossible to have communal ownership of this car. Somebody had to be at, at the base, um, the owner of the car. So I think, I think there is um, a lot of really important work that can happen at the policy level and the, the um, uh, legal uh, structures level and the institutional level to re-engineer the way that we think about ownership that's more, more aligned with those, those other forms of authorship or, or copyright or, or, or sense of intentionality. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I suppose um, if we're working in the art world, we can, to some extent, try and create our own systems um, outside of uh, try and take a holiday from capitalism and sort of try out different things. <laughs> um, I think we've got room for a couple more questions. So one from Anu. Thank you, Ron. Um, oh, I'll press the button one sec. Uh, um, how can I decolonially approach indigenous craft communities who have historically been travelers or caravanners as they don't have a direct relationship to land without a circular economy? 
Um, so, so when we think of the circular economy, we immediately think of ecosystems. And, and we've been told over and over again, the MacArthur Foundation, for example, has this huge circular economy website and sets of grants and publications. Um, but it's, all, it's almost 100% focused on circular ecological value. Um, and, and I find that particularly troubling because if you ask wealthy white people about their concerns towards the future, they'll mention the environment, you know, right away. They'll, they'll rarely, rarely mention uh, wealth inequality as mm. a problem. So if we think about circularity, not just of ecological value, but also circularity of labor value, right? And circularity of social value, um, then the tra travelers and, and the uh, caraveners um, are easily included because they do in fact, have all sorts of really interesting labor practices that are shared and knowledge practices that are shared within their community. And so the, the challenge is then, um, how do you make that fungible, right? So, so in, in a sense, it's protected in the particular forms that they have it, but it's also trapped in those forms. And so how do you make it uh, fungible, make it, make it turn into STEM education lessons or uh, uh, um, products that, that can now go out elsewhere in the world and do other things or uh, performances that can be more mobile or whatever it is you're going to do with that uh, cultural capital, right? Turning it into architecture or, or theater or technologies or what have you. Um, how do you, how do you uh, accomplish that is the challenge. Um, and so if you look through the generative justice website, um, we have various different strategies we've used with uh, different groups. Um, in some cases, um, trying to look at how something like uh, 3D printing um, or laser cutters, these kinds of digital fabrication tools um, can help make uh, artisans uh, um, um, just do a, a faster throughput if, if that's something they're interested in. I think it's very important to make sure that once you show them the array of possibilities, they're the ones who get to select, right? We don't want to start to in impose our ideas. Um, working with African-American communities, for example, um, I've noticed that um, uh, African-American youth, at least here in Detroit, um, will often, often gravitate towards 3D printers. Um, and kind of think of it, we saw that in, in New York City. We worked with a little school called Harlem Academy um, for a few years. Um, and, and, and that gravitation towards uh, 3D printing, um, to me, was very distinct. So, so here's a group that, given all the gadgets in the room, which one do you want to use? Everybody's saying the 3D printer, right? Um, working with Native American kids, I did not find that to be the case at all. So they too were using our culturally situated design tools, um, and they too were developing these virtual designs, starting with the, the traditional structures, right, but then modifying them and making their generations take on what these structures could be in this virtual space. But when it came time to move those structures um, to something that, that could be physically rendered, um, what I saw the Native American kids focusing on was handcrafting. And so what we ended up doing was rotating the 3D structure um, so that you were looking down on it and you could see where these poles, it was a wigwam simulation, where these poles would go into the ground, right? Um, and then we would print that out on paper, paste it onto wood and just hand them power drills, which a lot of them have never used before. They really love the power drills. Um, and so they would, they would drill the holes right where the 3D model was telling them to drill the holes. And then they could hand place the fibers into those holes, creating whatever it was they were making, right? So it was, so, it was sort of like going to Walmart and buying a 3D model, only it was a model that you would design yourself, but you still get the pleasure, the handcrafting of, of putting that together. And so I, I think it's really important to be able to allow each group to sort of explore and develop its own strategies um, for doing that kind of specificity. So if you, you know, if you look at uh, uh, African American history, what gets taken away is your ability to put labor where you want. It's forced labor. Whereas for the Native American kids, they're looking back at their history. What gets taken away is their traditions, relationships to these plants and these fibers and so on. So it makes sense that this group, in order to decolonize, would want to bring back that handcrafting that was taken away 
Um, whereas for the African American group, what, what they want back is their labor time, right? If I can get this gadget to do all this stuff for me, that's great. That's that's freedom. That's agency. Um, and so I, 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 we worked with another group, completely different take on things. Um, so this was in West Africa. They were doing batik. So they were stamping cloth with wax, uh, dyeing the cloth and then boiling off the wax. And then if they wanted to, they could do a second dye if they didn't want white patterns. Um, but they were using latex sponges and they were not decomposing and there was no trash pickup. So they just big pile of discarded latex sponge. Um, and they asked if we could come up with a stamp that was biodegradable. So we 3D printed a, a negative of the pattern and then poured mushroom spores with um, some, some uh, sawdust in there. And the mushrooms would create this um, foam. And then you could pull that out. And now you had a biodegradable stamp. Um, and, so, and so that was, that was you know, their interest in, in getting into this sort of technological aid to what they were doing. Um, so I can imagine the travelers and caravaners, you know, if you give them the opportunity to experiment, they'll come up with their own array of sensors or communication devices or fabrication devices or whatever it is. Uh, that's going to suit their circumstances the best. <laughs> Lovely. Um, I think uh, we can ask one more question of you before giving uh, Wendy the live captionist uh, a rest. Um, well deserved. Um, so one from Alan Blackwell. Um, do you think there are opportunities for academics in low income countries or indigenous scientists to become the leaders in computational research agendas, not just their own traditions? Um, that would that would be a, a dream come true. Um, and, and, you know, we've we've seen some little we've seen some little inklings of that. So so if I can just do the share screen um, one last time, sure. uh, if, if that's OK. Um, so so uh, let's go to our, our, our website here and we'll take a look at what was going on in Ghana with the Dinkra um, and under geometry. You can see we started to explore these um, uh, geometry lessons with a dinkra, and then we ran into this really interesting symbol here. Um, and you'll notice that this triangle has a little circular piece cut out of it, and this triangle has a little square piece cut out of it. So when I ask math teachers what that is, they first say that's reflection symmetry. And then I say, well, no, that's not quite right. These aren't exact copies of each other. In fact, this triangle is missing a circle, and this one has an extra circle. And this triangle is missing a square, but this person down here has an extra square. And so what that's really showing you is not symmetry, but complementarity. And so if we think about complementarity as sort of having its own um, mathematical status, right, of, of course, in Europe, we always think about making sure that I get a fair trade. I, I want as much value as the money I give you. And so the interaction has to end right there. Whereas in Africa, you've got this um, circular economy. It's relational. And so you're, you're trying to always make sure that your step, right, to make sure that, that um, uh, you, you help me and I help you. And so if you, if you think about um, these things as a kind of mutuality, you can then start asking mathematical questions. Can mutuals be in sets of three rather than in pairs or in higher numbers than three? Could they be fractional? Figure A is an 82% mutual to figure B. Could you look at, for example, the lock and key model of, of viruses and antibodies as a kind of mutuality, right? So, so I do, I am optimistic that there, there is in fact uh, um, opportunities here for um, uh, scientists in developing worlds and students in developing worlds to explore these mathematical ideas and algorithms in ways that are are unique and, and make a, a, a real uh, academic contribution. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, an amazing uh, talk again. Thanks so much, uh, Ron, for um, your contributions here. Um, I've been involved with algorithmic art for maybe two decades, but this is really um, opening things up so much for me. It just um, brings so much meaning and also hope for uh, the future. And um, yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed indeed um, that we can uh, uh, make a contribution that goes beyond our 
computers and uh, yeah hopefully contribute towards um, a restorative future. So All thanks right. again to Ron um, and uh, thanks all the audience for being here and um, yeah, see you at the next talk, which will be in about, uh, yeah, a week. I think it is um, the Conical talk with BC Manjinath next, um, but have a look on algorithmicpattern.org to check. Okay, thanks everyone, take care.